to those drivers who find themselves uh, on the dole as a result of the CityLink decision. Thank you. We now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by the First Minister on Ebola. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister, around 10 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, I want to begin by passing on my best wishes for 2015 to you and indeed to every member of the Chamber. Uh, since we last met as a Parliament, in addition to Nurse Pauline Kafferke's diagnosis with Ebola on the 29th of December, which I will address substantively in this statement, there have been, as we've just been hearing, two other major events which have cast a dark shadow over the festive period and which for the individuals and families affected have caused deep distress, suffering and sorrow. I'm referring, of course, to the dreadful tragedy which occurred at George Square on the 22nd of December and to the sinking of the cargo vessel in the Pentland Firth on the 3rd of January. I'm sure, presiding officer, that I speak on behalf of everyone in the chamber when I convey my sympathy to all those affected and especially to the families of those who have lost their lives. The Glasgow tragedy in particular touched all of us deeply and as the funerals of the victims have been taking place, I know our thoughts will have been with those who lost loved ones, just as they continue to be very much with all of those who are recovering from injury and trauma. Both of these tragedies, and indeed the response to the Ebola diagnosis, remind us yet again how much we owe to our emergency services, including the Coast Guard and the RNLI, and to all of the staff of our National Health Service. We value their professionalism, compassion and commitment every single day of the year but I think we do so especially at times like these and I'm sure the Chamber will join with me today in thanking them sincerely for the contribution that they make. Michael Matheson has, as the Chamber has just heard, already responded to a topical question about the George Square tragedy and Richard Lockhead has answered a question on the incident in the Pentland Firth. However, given the wider public health implications of Ebola, I thought it appropriate to make a full statement about Ms Caffrey's diagnosis, about our response to it and indeed about Scotland's general state of preparedness for handling the risk that Ebola poses. Let me start with a brief recap of the background to this case. It was confirmed on the 29th of December following her return to Scotland that Pauline Caffrey, who had been working in Sierra Leone to help those affected by Ebola, had tested positive for the condition. Early that morning, she had reported feeling unwell and at around 8am, she was admitted to the Brownlee Infectious Diseases Unit at Gartnaval Hospital in Glasgow. In the early hours of the 30th of December, <coughs> following confirmation of diagnosis, she was transferred by military aircraft to the UK's high-level isolation unit at the Royal Free Hospital in London. First and foremost, presiding officer, our thoughts are with Pauline Caffrey and with her family during this extremely difficult and distressing time. My officials have spoken to the Royal Free Hospital earlier today and they report that her condition remains critical. And I know that we all wish her a full and as speedy as possible a recovery. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of the NHS Scotland staff who helped to treat her, including those in the Scottish Ambulance Service, the Brownlee Unit and Health Protection Scotland. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the Ministry of Defence for arranging her transfer from Glasgow to London and the staff at the Royal Free Hospital who continue to ensure that she receives the best possible care, treatment and attention. Our chief concern at this time is, of course, as I have already said, for Pauline Caffrey's well-being. However, her diagnosis inevitably raised wider issues relating to public health, the response to this particular case and to our general preparedness to handle cases of Ebola. And it is to these issues that I now want to turn. The first point to stress, presiding officer, and it is, as I'm sure all members will agree, an important point, is that the risk to the public in Scotland from Ebola continues to be very low. The Ebola virus cannot be contracted from someone unless they are displaying its symptoms. Furthermore, it's not an airborne virus. Even if someone has a fever, the disease can only be transmitted by direct contact with their blood or bodily fluids. In the case of Pauline Caffrey, she was screened on leaving Sierra Leone and then again on arrival at Heathrow. On her initial screening, her temperature was found to be within the acceptable range and she was cleared to fly from Heathrow to Glasgow. 
However, due to concerns that she may have had an elevated temperature, she was reassessed and her temperature taken a further six times over a 30-minute period. Her temperature remained within the acceptable range and she was again cleared to fly. And I'll come back to uh, this point later on. However, as has already been made clear, because she was not at that point displaying any symptoms that would have given rise to onward transmission, the risk to other passengers on her flights was extremely low. However, given the nature of Ebola, a highly precautionary approach has been rightly, in my view, adopted by health authorities across the UK. It is in this context that a decision was taken to contact all passengers on the flights that Ms Caffrey had taken from Casablanca to Heathrow and then from Heathrow to Glasgow. And I'm grateful to staff at Health Protection Scotland who have now contacted all of the passengers on the London to Glasgow flight and ensured that they have the appropriate advice and reassurance. Ms Caffrey had contact with only one other person on her return to Scotland and he has also been contacted and given advice and reassurance. NHS 24 established a special helpline which was up and running within two hours of notification of the positive diagnosis. The helpline provided advice, assistance and reassurance to more than 100 people on the evening of 29th of December. It has received 179 calls in total. Only three of these calls have been received since Hugmanay and so the helpline will be closed from 6pm tonight. It can, however, be reactivated very quickly should the need arise in future. The prompt response to this diagnosis demonstrates a wider point. Scotland is well prepared to deal with cases of this nature. We have well tested NHS systems for managing unusual infectious diseases when they arise. For example, we have established three regional units for the management of possible or confirmed cases of Ebola, one of which is the Brownlee unit. We participate in UK protocols around more highly specialised uh, high-level isolation facilities and where necessary we fund treatment for Scottish patients at the Royal Free. We've also updated the Scottish Ambulance Service's procedures for transferring patients with suspected or confirmed Ebola. And a new testing system for diseases such as Ebola has been available in Scotland since the 1st of December. What that means is that samples no longer have to be transferred as they were previously to Porton Down in Wiltshire. Test results instead now go to the NHS Lothian testing facility and therefore can be confirmed much more rapidly. All of these systems and procedures have worked effectively in recent days. In addition, the Scottish Government works closely with the UK Government to ensure that we have a fully coordinated approach. As well as chairing meetings of the Scottish Government Resilience Committee on Monday and Tuesday of last week, I participated in a COBRA meeting and was in close touch with the Prime Minister. I am very grateful to counterparts in the UK Government for their cooperation and I know that they also appreciate the good work done by the NHS and other agencies in Scotland. We will continue to work with UK Government colleagues to review the handling of this case and to see what lessons can be learned for the future. For example, and this is a point I said I would return to, questions have understandably been asked about whether Ms Caffrey, even though her temperature readings were within an acceptable range, should have been allowed to travel to Glasgow given the concerns she had raised. These are important questions that deserve to be properly considered in line with the highly precautionary approach that we all agree should be taken to possible Ebola cases. Health Protection Scotland is therefore currently working closely with Public Health England to review screening procedures. Indeed, protocols at airports have already been revised in light of this case. The guidance has been strengthened to ensure that anyone from a higher risk group who feels unwell will be reassessed. Advice will also be sought immediately from an infectious diseases specialist and the passenger referred on for testing if that is considered appropriate. Procedures will be reviewed again in the coming days to assess the effects and the effectiveness of these changes and we will continue to work with the UK Government on further improvements to how we manage the risk of Ebola going forward. Presiding officer, I think in all of this there is a, a final but very important point to make and I hope it's one that the whole chamber uh, will agree with. By far uh, the most effective way of reducing the risk of Ebola in Scotland and indeed in the rest of the UK is to halt its spread in West Africa. That is why the Scottish Government has donated £1 million in money and equipment to support the Ebola response there. And it's why 
we are so deeply grateful for the quiet heroism of Pauline Caffrey and many others like her from Scotland, the rest of the UK and indeed from many other countries who make all of us safer by placing themselves at risk. They're not simply helping people in West Africa, though they are certainly doing that. They're also helping people right around the world. We owe it to them, as well as owing it to the wider public, to ensure that the measures we are taking to tackle Ebola here in Scotland are as good as they possibly can be. So, Presiding Officer, I want to assure you and the Chamber that this Government will ensure that these measures are robust that the public continues to have accurate and up-to-date information about Ebola, that screening procedures are as effective as possible, and that when it is necessary, which is hopefully rarely, patients will get the best possible care and treatment. The Government will keep the Chamber informed of further developments as they arise, but for now I'm happy to answer any questions that members have. Thank you. The First Minister will take questions on issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow you around 20 minutes for the questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the First Minister for the statement and send the sympathy uh, and thoughts of these benches to all the families affected by tragic events at George Square and indeed in the Pentland Firth. I'd also like to pay tribute to our staff in NHS, the Coast Guard, the RNLI and our emergency services for all their compassion and dedication. And I too would like to pay tribute to Pauline Caffrey. Her bravery is extraordinary. Hero is a word uh, that we use too readily, presiding officer, and in so doing diminish its value. The definition of a hero is someone who risks their own life for others, someone who puts themselves in danger for the benefit of others. Someone who doesn't think what it will cost them personally, but acts because they must, because someone must. Pauline Caffrey is a hero, as are all of the aid workers helping to fight Ebola. Heroes whose names we will never know. Can I also take this opportunity to recognise the vital work of UK charities like Save the Children, Oxfam and Christian Aid, who are doing so much to respond to the outbreak. Ebola has taken hold in countries that are least equipped to cope with it. The outbreak has devastated health systems in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, leaving many unable to receive treatment for conditions like measles and malaria, and thus increasing the death toll. There is a huge difference between the response and care the NHS is able to, pro to provide here, presiding officer, and the equivalent in Western Africa. I am proud of the UK's international development work, and I very much welcome the £1 million that the Scottish Government has committed to that end. Can I therefore ask the First Minister to tell us more about how this money will both help tackle the outbreak in Western Africa and guard against another in the future? First Minister. Um, can I thank Kezia Dugdale very much for her contribution, for her question and indeed for uh, the tone in uh, which she asked it. I uh, agree very strongly with her comments about the heroism, certainly of Pauline Caffrey, but also of all of the health workers, the aid uh, and charity workers. And indeed, I think it's uh, fair to say uh, those representatives of media organisations across the world who are covering uh, this issue in order that the rest of us can be updated on its progress. They, all of them, without exception, put their lives on the line to do this. We hope that they will be safe. Uh, the procedures and the protocols are in place to ensure as best as can be done their safety. But they all take uh, a great personal risk and all of us should be very grateful to them and very appreciative to them for that. Because as I said in my statement and as Kezia, uh, Doug Dale has... Uh, echoed, uh, they are not uh, only helping people in the affected countries in West Africa, they are also helping all of us to stem uh, the spread of that uh, disease. Um, in terms of uh, Kezia Dugdale's specific question, I had already uh, indicated that the Scottish Government has to date donated £1 million in cash and equipment uh, to the uh, effort to halt the spread of uh, Ebola in West Africa. That breaks down to uh, 500,000 that we've made available to the World Health Organisation, 300,000 in medical equipment and uh, a further 200,000 that we contributed to the DEC appeal uh, not long uh, before Christmas. All of that money will be used uh, by those organisations and those individuals on the ground to make sure uh, that the facilities are in place with the right equipment, that the right staffing uh, expertise and skill is there to do what needs to be done uh, on the ground to do everything possible to halt the spread of this disease. Uh, I should say that although that is what we have done, uh, 
I remain, as the government uh, does, remains very open to anything more we can do, not just to prepare in uh, Scotland for uh, any further cases of Ebola, but to make sure we are playing our part in what is a coordinated international effort to do everything that we can to halt its uh, Halt its spread. Uh, finally, presiding officer, I should say, just in, uh, on the evening of the 29th of December, I uh, telephoned all of the party leaders to update them with what we knew on the Pauline Caffrey case, and that is very much the spirit in which we will continue to deal with this. Uh, and I'd be very happy at any time to give either uh, the party leaders or uh, the health uh, spokespersons, and I know Shona Robinson will uh, be to any briefing on what we are doing to help in West Africa, or indeed our preparedness here in Scotland. Jackson Carlop. Uh, thank you. Can I thank you, First Minister, your ministerial colleagues, officials and all those in the emergency services who went about with quiet dignity, whatever their role, faced with the various traumas that we have been discussing this afternoon. I think in the way that we and they face these matters, it, is still, it, it, it creates a great sense of quiet pride in Scotland uh, in the face of really enormous tragedy. I do wonder in this social media age if the First Minister would agree with me that while it can be a useful information tool, it would be better if those who know nothing say nothing and those who have no need to be in the vicinity stay away. And I think that would be a useful lesson for the wider public in the future. In respect to Pauline Caffrey, can I say our thoughts are with her? And I know that trips off the trunk so glibly, but it shouldn't. She is deserving of nothing less than the support, love, affection of everyone in this chamber in Scotland and the wider United Kingdom. She and all those like her who selflessly put themselves in the face of great hazards in the service of others really deserve our total support. And I know we all wish her well in the fight she now has back to greater health. My only further question in respect of that would be, given her experience as a healthcare worker, and I think the First Minister did touch on this, should the concerns she herself expressed on arriving in the UK not just in case of other passengers on the flight, but in her own case, perhaps have saved her the trauma and the somewhat sensationalist coverage of her return to the Royal Free Hospital in London. A more excessively precautionary case would have been given her experience if perhaps that had been taken more seriously and she had perhaps had the opportunity to stay in London and be properly assessed at that point. First Minister. Well, I'm grateful to Jackson Carlow for uh, his comments and uh, his question, which I'll come to very directly in a moment. Um, I'm sure all of the frontline NHS staff and indeed the police and, and the fire uh, services who have uh, dealt uh, collectively uh, with these challenges will appreciate his words of support. Uh, I do think it's important that when tragedy hits, we do all try to come together to present uh, the right response to that collectively and I, I think Scotland can be proud of itself and how it has done that in recent times. Um, I agree with him about social media as a uh, I was going to say avid and possibly prolific user of social media myself, as I know uh, Jackson Carlaw is. It is a, a wonderful innovation. It is good for democracy. It opens up our public debate to many, many more people than otherwise would be able to participate in it. But it has its downsides. And I think everybody, particularly at times uh, like these, should behave responsibly um, and be careful about the information they are communicating and be careful about their actions. Uh, there are uh, many people who uh, will remain nameless uh, in all cases who would have been better to stay off social media uh, in uh, the aftermath of some of what we've seen uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but, you know, they are the minority, the tiny minority. And I know in the aftermath of the Glasgow tragedy, social media was very helpful in, for example, encouraging people who were in the city centre to contact their loved ones to let them know they were OK and take the pressure off the helpline that the police had set up for those uh, who really needed it. In relation to Jackson Carlaw's uh, substantive question, um, I think the, the short answer is yes, I do think that is a, a reasonable point, and I did touch on that in my statement. I think it's important to stress, and as Jackson Carlaw would expect, this is a point that was interrogated very closely by myself, by uh, government colleagues, and indeed by uh, colleagues in the UK government. And it is important to stress that the guidance and the protocols around screening were adhered to in the case of Pauline Caffrey. The question that arose, though, is whether those protocols and that guidance was precautionary enough. 
we did have here an experienced health professional um, and the question that has arisen and ha is being and has been looked at is whether where there is concern that somebody who has been in an affected area, uh, that that should be treated more precautionarily. And that is behind the changes I've already spoken about and will be very much behind the ongoing review of the screening uh, protocols that will be underway in the days to come. And you know, that all underlines the approach that all of us are taking to this. The risk is low, and I don't think we can say that often enough at the moment in terms of public reassurance. The risk to all of us right now is very low. The risk to people who came into contact with Pauline Cafferty last week was low to the point of negligible. Uh, but nevertheless, the understanding and the learning about this virus is still developing. And given the stage we are at, we need to act on the highest possible basis of precaution, and that's exactly what we will do. Well, Doris, followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, President officer, as others have done, can I also pay tribute to the selfless work of Pauline Cafferkey and others and pray that Pauline makes a, a full recovery. I uh, understand that 25 healthcare workers will return from Sierra Leone in the next fortnight or so, with speculation in the media over a range of new safeguards that may be put in place, including when to isolate potentially at-risk individuals. Does the Cabinet Secretary so as the First Minister, I apologise, uh, agree with me that additional safeguards should be proportionate based on emerging scientific evidence and kept under ongoing review. But also, finally, that information is vitally important and that families of healthcare workers that are involved in the field in Sierra Leone, they're also uh, who are deeply worried at this time for their family and loved ones, that they're given adequate information to reassure them. First Minister. Uh, yeah, no, I absolutely agree with Bob Doris's points, particularly the last point about making sure there is information, not just for the general public, but for those who have loved ones in the affected countries or returning. I should say well, two things quickly. Firstly, uh, we will keep all of the procedures under review. It's important that we learn lessons from the case uh, of Pauline Cafferkey and that we learn lessons from any other cases that might arise. I hope there are no other cases identified in Scotland or the UK, but it is likely that we will see other cases, small number uh, of additional cases, and we need to keep learning from the experience of dealing with them. I've already uh, made my comments about the screening process and how we need to learn lessons around it. I think the only other point I would make here is that we do have robust arrangements in place for monitoring people who come back for the entirety of the incubation period for Ebola, which is 21 days. So depending on the risk category that somebody coming back from one of the affected uh, countries is in, there will be restrictions on uh, travel. That in all cases, there will be monitoring uh, of temperature, for example, and in some of the higher risk uh, categories, uh, there will be daily contact with local occupational health services or with Health Protection Scotland. So we have robust arrangements in place, but we will continue to keep them under review. And you know, finally, I agree with Bob Dorsey's point. We must make sure that everything we do is driven by expert advice and by the science uh, of those who are looking very carefully at this disease. Jenny Mara, followed by Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We agree with the, um, with the, the medical advice and with the First Minister that the risk is very low in Scotland, but I know she's as concerned as we are about how prepared our health service is. Now, guidance for primary care and for hospitals is on the Health Protection Scotland website. Is the First Minister confident that our health professionals in all our communities across the country are familiar with these lengthy guidelines so that they can respond swiftly, confidently and accurately if a potential case of Ebola were to be presented? First Minister. Well, it's her job and the job of the health service to make sure that is the case. Um, I, I'm not going to stand here and with any hint of complacency say that there is no improvement that we can make as we learn more about this virus and as we have the experience of dealing with the case, because there clearly will be, and I, I know that all of us who have been involved in dealing with this over the last few days have got you know, thoughts of our own about how we improve things uh, going forward. But what I do know from the experience of uh, Pauline Cafferkey's case is that the health professionals in Scotland uh, who dealt with that case did so very professionally and in line with all the guidance and the protocols in place. Clearly, the staff at the Brownlee unit at Gartnavel were in the front line of that and deserve you know, our enormous thanks and, and gratitude. The Scottish Ambulance Service were also in the front line and will be in terms of transporting 
patients, the guidance that they follow has been updated. Um, so I am confident that what we saw last week was a very professional and very expert response. But not just those of us in government, those of us who are dealing with that in the front line will want to make sure that we continue to ensure that everything is as, as it should be. And there is always, not just here, but in all uh, cases of uh, unusual diseases, there is an ongoing need to A, make sure the guidance is up to date and is developing in line with developing knowledge and understanding, but the health professionals uh, are familiar with and conversant in that guidance so that if they find themselves in the position of dealing with a case, they know what to do. Colin Keir, followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I associate myself with a comment regarding Pauline Cafferkey and others, uh, by other members? Um, given their previous comments, perhaps uh, the First Minister can elaborate what discussions have taken place to ensure robust screening for passengers arriving at Scottish airports whose journeys possibly have originated within countries of high contamination or concentrations of Ebola virus contamination. First Minister. Um, in terms of the issue of screening at Scottish airports, I mean, I, we will keep that under review, obviously, but I think it's important to point out a couple of things there. The estimate is that somewhere in the region of 97% of travellers to the UK from affected countries uh, are captured by the current entry screening arrangements that are in place in England with the remainder or many of the remainder screened elsewhere in Europe before travelling on here. There are very small numbers of travellers to Scotland who arrive here via routes that don't include English hubs. Uh, so that's the first point. But the second point is one of the things about screening that I think people have to be aware of is that however important <coughs> it is, and it is important, there is a risk around screening that it leads to false reassurance because, as I've already said, the incubation period for Ebola is 21 days. Somebody had been screened and found to have their temperature within normal range. Uh, that means they're okay then. It doesn't mean they will not go on to develop uh, the symptoms of Ebola later on. And that makes the monitoring arrangements so important. I've already uh, gone into a little bit of detail about them. And they are, uh, the, I think, the most important arrangements in terms of the notification from Health Protection Scotland of expected returners and then the system that kicks in with Health Protection Scotland and local health boards to make sure people are uh, monitored depending on the degree of risk that they're in. So I am confident that these arrangements are robust and that they worked well last week. But as I've already said in response to other questions, we will keep them under ongoing review. Jim Hume, followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you. I join with others in the chamber in saying that our thoughts are with uh, Pauline Cafferkey and her family, and of course the families and friends of all those who have uh, suffered uh, from, the, from the Glasgow tragedy and uh, the one in the Pentland Firth. And of course, thanks to our, our brave emergency services. As we know, uh, Save the Children are currently investigating how Pauline contracted the disease. Clearly, it's crucial that the source can be isolated as quick as possible to safeguard the well-being of our overseas uh, brave volunteer staff who are caring for Ebola victims. Can the First Minister therefore provide an assurance that the, that the Scottish Government will support Save the Children in that investigation and, if needed, will provide medical expertise or technical resources to support the charity in doing so? And uh, regarding uh, Health Protection Scotland, working closely with Public Health England in reviewing uh, the, their screening procedures, can the First Minister give an indication of when that review, review could be complete uh, and reported on? First Minister. Okay, um, first uh, question Jim Hume raises about how Pauline Caffrey contracted uh, Ebola. I think Save the Children are to be commended for the very swift and uh, very rigorous review that they have embarked upon, and that obviously has to be allowed to take its course. <laughs> And the Scottish Government would be very happy to provide any support and assistance that they thought uh, was required. And, you know, that is, is an offer that I, I freely make. Uh, Jim Hume's right to raise this point because, of course, we can have all the procedures we want in place here, but we hope people who are working on the front line don't contract it. And for that to be the case, that means that the protocols and procedures there have to be uh, absolutely robust. Uh, in terms of the second question, um, the review of the screening procedures will be ongoing um, and I've, as I've already said some changes to the procedures in place have already been made to deal precisely with the situation where somebody in a high risk category you know there are concerns so that a more precautionary approach is taken how uh, that 
revised procedure operates will be reviewed over the coming days and weeks uh, and we'll continue to keep that under review. Any uh, substantial changes to the protocol and procedures in place I'm sure would be uh, communicated in, in the normal way but it's not a case of doing a review and that is it. It's a case of making sure that these uh, arrangements are kept under ongoing review. James Kelly followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I join others in paying tribute to Pauline Cafferke, uh, my constituent, uh, whose courage and compassion is a, an example to us all. Uh, I, I'm sure our thoughts are with her family and we wish her a full recovery. The First Minister said in a statement that all passengers who had travelled on the flight from Heathrow to Glasgow had been contacted by Health Protection Scotland and provided with advice and assurance. Can I ask if there's been any follow-up to that uh, to ensure that none of those passengers in the intervening period uh, are exhibiting any signs of being at risk from Ebola? First Minister. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I, I, I agree, as uh, everybody does, with James Kelly's initial statement about Pauline Cafford Kay and how difficult a time this is for her family. On the question uh, James Kelly asks, in terms of the follow-up with passengers on the plane, uh, there were effectively two categories of passenger, uh, passengers who were... Uh, considered to have been in close proximity, which were, uh, to, to cut the short, passengers in the two rows behind and the two rows in front of where Pauline Cafferke was sitting. Uh, I think there were, from memory, eight passengers in that category. They have been uh, contacted and they are being monitored. Uh, the other passengers who were considered to be uh, not in close proximity, they were contacted principally to be offered advice and reassurance and told what they should do should anything untoward be experienced by them. So that is the approach that was taken. It's the same approach that was taken by Public Health England in respect of the Casablanca to Heathrow flight. Um, and you know, a similar approach was taken to the one other person that Pauline Cafferke had been in contact with. So uh, the only other point to make there, which is one I've made implicitly already, uh, that was something done on a highly precautionary basis. It wasn't intended to give any indication that there was any concern about the health of the passengers on the plane. Simply because we're operating on that highly precautionary basis, it was deemed to be the right thing to do, and I certainly think it was the right decision. Dennis Robertson, followed by Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister, <coughs> if she's aware that if all our health boards have the necessary procedures in place to isolate patients who are considered maybe potential carriers of Ebola whilst they're being tested? First Minister. Um, the short answer to that question is, is yes. Uh, health Protection Scotland has assessed the capacity within NHS Scotland to accommodate suspected cases and all NHS boards have appropriate plans and equipment in place. As I said earlier, as uh, the Health Secretary said earlier on as well, we've established three regional units for the management of either possible or confirmed cases. They are in Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh and Aberdeen. And across those three units, we have 14 negative pressure rooms and more than 50 isolation rooms. Uh, Patients that require high-level isolation will go to the Royal Free. All four UK nations uh, cooperate in UK protocols. Uh, I should say, uh, just uh, very briefly, the Royal Free is a very, very specialist facility. Uh, in the United States of America, which is a population of what, 300 million uh, people, there are only four units of the same type as the Royal Free. That's how specialist these units are. Many other European countries don't have facilities of the standard of the Royal Free. So it is absolutely right that where patients need that uh, treatment, that that's what they get. And of course, my final uh, point, just for the record, NHS Scotland, of course, pays for any treatment in the Royal Free that is got by uh, Scottish patients. Richard Simpson Thank and you. finally I, Stuart Maxwell. Can I very much welcome the way in which the Government Health Protection Scotland and all the health professionals have dealt with this issue and the fact that the Minister has made it, First Minister has made it clear that the protocols are going to be updated because I was very concerned about the fact of having an, someone having an elevated temperature even within an acceptable range, although I have no idea what that means, I was then allowed to, to fly on to Glasgow without further testing. But my question is there are not just health workers going to return from West Africa, but there are constant travellers coming from West Africa. What advice is being given to them or displayed to them so that we can ensure that those who are travelling back to this country are aware that if they develop a temperature, this could be 
obviously the most common thing would be malaria, but if it, it could possibly be related to Ebola if they've traveled from West Africa. So what information is being given, not just to the 97% who fly through England, but, uh, or through Heathrow, but also the other 3% uh, who are traveling other, from other areas directly? First Minister. I mean, it's an important point. Obviously, one of the, not the only, but one of the, the benefits of screening, I mean, I've talked already about the danger around screening of false reassurance. Uh, but notwithstanding that, one of the big benefits of screening is the contact it gives with people, whoever they are, coming from affected countries to make sure they've got the right information, the right advice, the right guidance in terms of what to do should anything uh, of concern arise. Uh, the monitoring I've already uh, gone through. Health Protection Scotland has also uh, worked uh, very proactively with stakeholders so that people who are likely to travel to affected countries, whether that is aid workers, uh, oil and gas workers or uh, students, are registered into the Ebola monitoring programme, which then triggers the notice and the information that's given when people return. They're given information uh, before they leave to uh, advise them on what they should and shouldn't do and they're also then contacted on their return uh, so that the risk assessment can be carried out and appropriate advice given there's information posters and leaflets uh, that have been developed by Health Protection Scotland and deployed at ports of entry to provide information to travellers. So there's a whole range of work that's been done to raise awareness of what people should do and that work will continue in the weeks and months to come. Uh, presiding officer, the First Minister has detailed the work underway in the UK at present. However, given the international nature of the threat, can the First Minister tell me what steps are being taken at the European Union level to coordinate a response to Ebola and what response and, and influence the Scottish Government has in these discussions? First Minister. Well, it's a very good point because, you know, in order to combat Ebola at source, uh, there requires to be, and there is, but there will continue to require to be a very coordinated international response. Uh, public health specialists from Scotland are involved in discussions at European level on the response to Ebola, and they will continue to be so. And that includes, uh, crucially and, and very importantly, participation in the European Health Security committee where uh, these matters are discussed uh, and, and taken forward. So I can uh, reassure Stuart Maxwell that we will continue to play a full part in all aspects of the international response, as well as making sure we're doing what requires to be done at home uh, to ensure that our preparedness is up to scratch. Thank you. That ends the statement from the First Minister on Ebola. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number one.